introduce the next speaker, which is Steve Rose. He is a writer and policy analyst at Transform Drug Policy Foundation, as well as writing a range of journal articles, periodicals, and book chapters. Steve was lead author on many of Transform publications, including After the War on Drugs. So welcome up on stage, Steve Rolls. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so my talk's called Why Are Politicians Addicted to the War on Drugs? And How Can We Get Them Into Rehab? So I just, it's really just to think about why is it so difficult to, uh, to, to shift this, this war on drugs? Sometimes it seems like a, a zombie that will never die. You think, you think you've defeated it and then it comes back. But um, we can win this, we can win this argument. I just want to bounce some ideas off you around that today. Um, I want to talk about two reasons why I think politicians struggle to get beyond their addiction to the war on drugs. One is fear, really the political fear and the political dimension, and the other one is ignorance. Um, and I'll come to these in turn. Um, <clears throat> and they are both, I should say, luckily, things that we can do something about. So the first up is fear. Um, I think many politicians understand the reform arguments. I certainly got the sense yesterday from, the, from your Prime Minister that she understood the arguments but she just, didn't, she just didn't want to go there, however hard she was pushed. And she was pushed. Um, <clears throat> they understand that the war on drugs has been a disaster and that things need to change. But they are afraid of that change, not mostly because of the change itself, but because of the political fears around that cha change. They fear the reaction of a hostile media, and they fear the public reaction, particularly for some key audiences, some conservative groups, some parents and family groups, some more religious groups, some older, more traditional groups. The fear is that adopting a reform position will, will be a political liability, that it will cost them politically in votes, in popularity, and ultimately in power, which is what politicians all want. Now, politicians aren't all craven, power-crazed megalomaniacs, but most of them are. Um, and power, power is their currency, and we need to, we need to be honest and, and, and realistic about that. Um, <clears throat> and they fear the loss of that power. And it's quite ironic, because while they fear the political implications of ending the war on drugs, the war on drugs is itself a fear-based policy model. And we all know this. The war on drugs is rooted in the narrative of threat. The threat uh, of drugs to our children, to our communities, to our families. In some cases, the threat of drugs to the very fabric of society. Um, politicians have hyped up these drug threats, threats of addiction, of, of, of death, of, of, of madness chaos, criminality, and so on. And they've pre then presented themselves as our saviors and our protectors from this threat if we vote for them. Drug policy has been cast in these very stark binary moral terms as a battle between good and evil. Um, uh, drugs are evil, and I will fight them. I will protect you. This is the message we get from, from politicians. Drugs are actually referred to as evil in the UN Single Convention on Drugs, which is our, the foundational kind of international legal instrument of, of, of global prohibition. It's the only one of hundreds of different UN treaties that uses the word evil. Drugs are evil. Even things like chemical weapons and genocide aren't described in those terms, but drugs, evil. The war on drugs is literally a fight against evil, and it's an, it's an almost sort of religious narrative that has, it's deeply ingrained. This political construction of 
the drug threat and the war on drugs goes back a long time, for generations, over a hundred years now. It's deeply entrenched in the public discourse. And the problem, of course, is that when politicians have spent years talking tough on drugs in these terms, about how evil they are and how they will fight them, it can feel very difficult to change direction. In some ways, they've sort of painted themselves into a corner that they don't feel they can escape from. They feel any movement away from these established narratives will be portrayed as weakness or retreat or waving the white flag or surrender in the war on drugs. Um, and that's the last thing they want. Politicians do not want to be seen as weak. They want to be seen as tough and strong and resolute. Weakness is something they, they despise. So what can we do? Well, as a movement, uh, as civil society activists operating in our different fields, we need to help people understand that the threat isn't really from drugs, but it is from the war on drugs itself. This is a me message that uh, Inna made very clear in her opening statement yesterday. Of course, drug use can be risky, and we need to be honest about that. But we need to help people to understand that however risky a drug is, those risks are increased hugely in the context of criminalization and prohibition and illegal supply. And of course, the war on drugs has a wide array of other terrible costs. Um, <clears throat> fueling crime, undermining human rights, discriminating against minorities and marginalized groups, harming the environment, costing money, costing a lot of money, and this is one, another one that politicians do care about, is money, so you can use that one, especially with the conservatives. Um, and the critique, this critique of the war on drugs, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, has been getting louder and clearer for years now. The civil society movement, led by um, organizations like the Association for Safe Drug Policy and, and the Drug Policy Alliance in America and Transform and hundreds of organizations across across the world, have been bringing this critique to the mainstream public discourse. Um, and, you know, polling now shows that the majority of the public across Europe and across North America, where this debate is happening, now acknowledge and agree that the war on drugs has failed. Most people agree that. Most politicians agree that the war on drugs has failed. We've made huge progress on this, and of course, that has to continue. It's an attritional process, and you know, sometimes it's changing just one mind at a time, but we have to keep going with that. But it's not just about the critique. It's not just about the critique. It's also about the vision of what we do after the war on drugs. We can't just say the war on drugs is, is terrible and all agree that it's terrible and expect change if, if the, what we change to is not clear and understood and compelling for the same audiences. And this is where the ignorance part of this comes in. And I say ignorance as in a lack of understanding and a lack of, uh, of knowledge, not, not stupidity. I, I mean, there are stupid politicians, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a lack of understanding. Um, because helping people, uh, including politicians, to understand the alternatives to the war on drugs can be difficult especially when we go beyond decriminalization and harm reduction to look at legalization and regulation of drugs. It's, it's, it's a challenging argument to make. And then especially when we go beyond legalization and regulation of cannabis to look at legalizing and regulating some of the more risky drugs. We have to not only address that ignorance by explaining how it will work, we have to also provide a vision of a better future that people can believe in and buy into. And we need to develop the tools for talking about this vision clearly and concisely. And this is not easy. Drug war sound bites are much easier than more sophisticated discussions about regulation models. Um, some of you may have seen one of the Transform books out there. It's 200 pages long. Uh, we need to have bumper stickers that are like, 10 words long, 
not 200-page books. I'm not saying, read the book, it's really good, but it, it, we need bumper sticker, we need bumper sticker messaging as well. Um, so it means not just writing books, but actually convincing people and politicians that these ideas will work and that they will make our lives better and their lives better, and we need to address their concerns, address their fears, and, and make them believe that these reforms can have a positive impact on their lives, not just on the lives of people who use drugs, their communities, their families, people who don't use drugs. And many of these fears are very legitimate. People do worry about drug risks. People do worry that if drugs were available, if you know, cocaine and MDMA and heroin were available, like alcohol is available in, in stores here, although it's really expensive in Norway. What's, what's going on with that? <laughs> so expensive. Um, if it was available like alcohol, you know, people worry that, that would, you know, more people would take drugs and more people would get addicted and more people would die and so on. These are legitimate concerns and fears that we need to make, that we need to address. I think we can persuade people that drugs can be regulated in a responsible way, but these fears are not completely irrational. Regulation will always be better than prohibition, but it can be done well or badly, and we have a responsibility to make sure that it's done right. Now, people may be able to understand the idea of legal cannabis, but if you talk about legal cocaine and MDMA or legal LSD or legal heroin, some people do freak out. And remember, they have generation, their minds are full of generations of drug, drug war propaganda. It's not easy, it takes time, but it is possible. We've seen reforms that seemed impossible happening all over the world. Cannabis reform legalization seemed impossible 15, 20 years ago. It's now happening in 18 states in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, in Uruguay, in South Africa, Luxembourg, Switzerland, the Netherlands, all over the place. There's actually a bill in the Colombian Senate now, being debated now, like literally this week, um, to legalize and regulate coca leaf and cocaine powder in Colombia. So there is, you know, this is serious policy proposals to legalize and regulate cocaine are being discussed and getting support in the Colombian Senate. These things would have been impossible five, ten years ago, but they're possible now and they're happening. So we need to stay, we need to stay the course, we need to believe. Um, I want to conclude with a few lessons we've learned over the years on how we can achieve this, some of these changes, and how we can address some of this fear and ignorance. We have to show politicians that reform is a political asset and not a political liability that there are benefits for them politically and not just costs. Now, in the US, cannabis reforms were achieved in the first instance, I'm sure Ethan will be talking about some of this later, uh, were, were achieved in the first instance through public votes, through ballot initiatives, not political leadership um, in the legislatures. It was when support for cannabis reached a majority amongst Democrats and Republicans that things really began to change and really began to move. And that happened without the leadership from either of the big political parties. But instead, it was a coalition of civil society groups like us who pushed these reforms forward. We need to win the public and the media first, and the politicians will follow. We may be lucky, we may find some po politicians who have the courage and leadership to, to take this forward, but we may not. So we have to, have, we have to win over the public, and, and, and the politicians will follow. We need to use human stories and engage people at an emotional level. All the political research suggests that people do not generally have their minds changed by evidence and statistics. It's sad, but it's true. But human stories can engage people and change their minds and shift their understanding. This is something I think the Association for Safer Drug Policies does incredibly well already. So I don't mean to sound patronizing on this. I think your, your poster campaign that we, you were talking about yesterday is just totally awesome. And you already do that. You engage people at a human, emotional level and change minds very effectively. Um, Transform, we have an initiative called Anyone's Child, uh, where parents and families who have lost people to overdose or, or drug-related deaths tell their stories, not just about drug-related harms, but about drug-war-related harms, 
and why their losses have inspired them to campaign for change and reform and regulation. It's been amazingly effective for us, reaching new audiences and new media that you know, I, my boring books can never, never get to, because nobody reads them, apart from some of the nerds here. Um, and we need to move outside of our bubble and have the difficult conversations with people who disagree with us, who don't think like we do, who, 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 people who hate drugs and, or, or are disgusted by drugs. Um, it, it's those difficult, uncomfortable conversations where change really happens. So we need to go to the difficult places and talk to those difficult people, however painful and um, annoying it may seem. And related to this, we need to find champions amongst those groups, amongst those unusual suspects. So the conservatives, the religious leaders, doctors, police. I mean, this is why LEAP is so brilliantly effective, because they are not the usual suspects parent groups, family groups, people who don't use drugs. This has real power when those groups and those people explain why they support reform and why they change their minds. And there's almost nobody, in my experience, over the last 20 years, who can't be won over, whose minds you can't change. If you have the energy and patience to engage, to talk openly, to listen to and respond to their concerns, and to meet them where they're at, you can change anybody's mind on this, because we're, we're right. And we need to learn lessons from the reforms of the past, the cannabis reforms around the world, decriminalization, the great harm reduction battles of the 80s and 90s, battles that are still going on in many parts of the world. You, you have a, a drug consumption room just down the road, on the, on the corner. Um, I, I had a tour of it when I was here in 2019. We don't have any drug consumption rooms in, in the UK yet, but we're that close. We're, we're just about to open two, three, maybe, maybe later this year, maybe next year. But we've been fighting for that for 15 years, but we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Um, it takes time. These things take time. And it can often be a series of incremental wins, some big wins, some small wins, but we always move forward. Well, sometimes it can be two steps forward, and one step back. But that's still one step forward. This is why I'm here, for some maths, serious maths. Two minus one is still one. <laughs> this is what they pay me for. Um, and, you know, I look at this with your, with your decrim reform. You know, you didn't win it this time, but you will, you'll win it next time, whether it's next month or next year or next election cycle. You will win, drugs will be decriminalized in Norway, and it will happen soon, and it will happen because of you guys. It will happen because of you. You did that. You will win. And it's worth remembering that every single one of these battles, every single one, whether it was the fights for methadone and needle exchanges in the 1990s, whether it was the fight for cannabis regulation in the US and Canada and Mexico and Uruguay, South Africa over the last decade, whether it was the fight for drug checking services in the UK in 2014-15, whether it was the fight for decrim here and across Europe and across the world, every single time we've won. Every single time we've won. Um, sometimes it takes longer than we'd like, sometimes it takes years, but every single time we have won. Because we fight fear with love and compassion, and we fight ignorance with knowledge and wisdom. And we will win, and we'll keep on winning, because we are on the right side of history. Thank you very much.